There are a great many uh, important points in history, aren't there? Important points where we would say the world was never the same after this happened. Usually things like battles, things like great wars, maybe big disasters, things like that change the world. You probably have similar kinds of things in your own life, days that you could point to or events that you could point to, or maybe it wasn't that specific, but a time, a time frame where you could point to and say, my life changed at that time, my life changed on that day. And that could be for the better. Hopefully you have those that you point to and say, things changed for me for the better on this day. Or it could be for the worst. My life went downhill after this. That led into a terrible time for me. Looking back, you can point those things out. The greatest event in the history of the world happened on a Friday. The greatest event in the history of the world happened outside of the city of Jerusalem on a Friday afternoon. There, the Son of God offered himself in your place on the cross. You weren't even there. You weren't even born. And yet from that day, from that time, the world changed. It was the greatest day in the history of the world. It was a serious day, to be sure, much like this is a serious day, but it was a supremely good day. Day. It was the supremely good day, and it's why we reflect on it. It's why we reflect on this day. We don't let it simply pass us by. We don't just give it a moment's notice and then get on with our busy lives, but we take time to reflect on the greatest thing that ever happened. I don't think it's too much to say that this is the center point of all of history. I don't mean it's the middle point, but I mean it is the central point. It is the most important point. It's the most important point of all of time and all of history. And so we should say that it is right in the middle of history. The sun is not in the middle of of the universe. And even the earth is not in the middle of the universe. But Jesus Christ is the center of the universe. And the things that happen to him, where he is, what he has done, those are the thing that all of history leads up to and comes out from. But it's easy to reflect on this in kind of the wrong way. Let me just caution you on one way that's wrong to reflect on the the passion of Jesus. And that's to view it just as kind of a sad, tragic story. It's easy to view it that way. It is tragic. A man, one of his closest friends, betrays him. He's done no wrong, and yet he's mocked, he's ridiculed, he's beaten, he's crucified. There is a terrible tragedy to it all. But if that is the extent of how we reflect on Jesus' passion, you know, like he's the sad character in the movie, the guy who's the good guy, but he just can't quite bring it all together, he doesn't quite get the girl. If we just weep a sad tear for poor old Jesus, then we haven't really reflected on what his crucifixion is. For today is not sad Friday, and Jesus is not sad Jesus. And in the end, he gets the girl. Today is good Friday. And so we reflect with a deeper interest. And to guide us in that reflection so that we actually see it for what it is, St. John has given us little hints. These things happened to fulfill Scripture. These things didn't happen by chance. These things didn't happen because of Pilate's scheming. These things didn't happen because the Jews conniving. These things happened to fulfill Scripture. And I want to just go through the four things that St. John says happened to fulfill Scripture so that you might reflect on the passion of your Lord, on his crucifixion, with a deeper meaning. First of all, it says that his garments were taken from him. It's kind of a sad irony, isn't it, that the soldiers who beat Jesus, who treated Jesus like garbage, show so much interest in his clothing, how backwards they get it. And if you were sitting there with the soldiers, you probably would have done the same. This was old hand for soldiers. They were trained for this. They were pros at it. And so they had no real interest about putting nails into a man's hand. Maybe they had a pang or two, but they did it because it was their job. And as he's dying on the tree, the soldiers decide to play a little game. But St. John tells us that these things happened to fulfill the scriptures. Don't let that detail pass you by. In Psalm 22, 
The psalm where Jesus prays, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It says these exact words, for my garments they cast lots. And in that psalm, we hear the voice of one who is righteous. We hear the voice of one who is innocent and yet who suffers in our place. In that psalm, we hear the cry of the righteous man, the one and only righteous man, who can truly cry out to God, come and help me, deliver me. But he is suffering not for his own sake, but for yours. That's why the next thing that Jesus says, the next thing that the soldiers do, the next thing that St. John tells us happened to fulfill the scriptures is Jesus says, I thirst. Now again, that detail could easily pass us by, right? Of course he was thirsty on the cross. I'm sure those two criminals who were side by side with him were also thirsty. But St. John doesn't tell us that this happened because, you know, Jesus' mouth was dry. It says it happened to fulfill the scriptures. And if you look back again into the Psalms, you can find in Psalm 69, there is a verse that says, I was thirsty and for my drink they gave me sour wine, which is exactly what happens in the Passion. But when you read that whole Psalm, again, you don't just get the impression that this is a random thing that happened on a Friday. Again, In that psalm, you hear the prayer of the one who calls out, the one who is suffering from his enemies and also who bears the wrath of God, who calls out for God to come to his aid. But those aren't the only things that happen to fulfill the scriptures. We're told after the fact, you know, after Jesus had finally died, that the Jews wanted to get the bodies off the cross because it was Passover the next day, and it was a big Passover. They didn't want stinking bodies rotting the land. So they said to Pilate, let's break his legs. Let's break their legs, you know, get them off the cross, make them die faster. It's all very business-like, isn't it? And Pilate says, okay, go ahead. So they go out there and they find the first criminal, break his legs. Find the second criminal, break his legs. And when they come to Jesus, he's already dead. And again, you could read that, you could hear that and think, well, he just died faster, right? It just happens that way. But it says this happened to fulfill the scripture, that not one of his bones would be broken. And what that scripture referred to was the Passover lamb. Remember that Passover lamb that was offered down in Egypt, that lamb whose blood covered the doorposts of the people of Israel, that lamb that was offered in place of their firstborn sons. That verse was not talking simply about a lamb, but it was talking about Jesus, who is your Passover lamb. Jesus, whose blood covers over the door of your heart. Jesus, who sets you free, not from Pharaoh, but who sets you free from sin and from death. None of these details are insignificant. None of them are unimportant, and none of them should be rushed over. There is one last detail. There is one last thing that St. John says happened to fulfill the scriptures. And it says this, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And again, right, if we were just reading this in kind of a cursory way, we could say, well, the soldiers wanted to make sure Jesus was really dead. So they did what soldiers do. They stuck him with a spear. But in the prophet Zechariah, this verse had been prophesied long ago. They will look on him whom they have pierced. They will look on me, it says actually in Zechariah. And who is speaking there in Zechariah? Not the prophet, but the Lord himself. Long beforehand, the Lord had prepared for this day. Long beforehand, the Lord had told his people, you will one day look on me, him whom you have pierced. And it happened on that Friday that they looked on him whom they had pierced. And you know what it goes on to say in Zechariah? Most of us probably don't, because Zechariah is like, you know, one of those books in the back of the Old Testament, that who gets to that? It says, on that day, on that day, the Lord will open a fountain for his people. And isn't that what happened on Mount Golgotha? Did not a fountain get opened for you? A fountain was opened there so that you might be cleansed from your sins. But it wasn't a fountain that came up out of the ground. It was a fountain that came from our Lord's side. For flowing from his side are blood and water and spirit. And those things flow out to you. And they cleanse you. They cleanse you not from bodily stains, but they cleanse you from those things that stain the soul, your sins. 
That is what was happening on that Good Friday. That is why Friday is the most important day, the central day in all of history. And now that fountain is open to you. That fountain lies open. What is the central point of history now? It's wherever Jesus' word is being proclaimed. At the center of history, at the center of the universe, are pulpits and lecterns and fonts and are the people of God's tables where the word of Jesus is spoken. There a fountain is freely flowing and that fountain delivers the benefits of Christ's cross. From Good Friday flows out into our world all good things. From the side of Jesus flows out into your life the promise of redemption. From the side of your Savior, from him whom they pierced, flows a fountain, a fountain of goodness, a fountain of forgiveness, a fountain of life. Wash yourself in that fountain. Immerse yourself in that fountain. Drink from that fountain, and you will find, you will find that at the center point of history, is God's great love for you in Christ Jesus. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.